What a life, eh, freak? One minute you're playing 21 and horse on the courts in Harlem, and the next moment you're in the showroom, configuring the gunmetal and graphite exterior of your luxury car and your iPad mini. <laughs> oh, I bet you get a crazy crowd when you drive that car around the block in the old neighborhood, huh? Yeah, living the dream. <laughs> Mad pandemonium. But folks from back around the way are real proud of me. Yeah, I hear you. Local kid makes good. You know, it kind of reminds me of when I took my tech stock public and I rang the New York Stock Exchange bell and my mom's friends called her up and said, Maggie, is that your son on Bloomberg News this morning ringing the bell? And my mom says, yes, sir, Bob, it was him. That was a great moment, Freak. And you know, our lives are like a pearl necklace of great moments, all strung together with the finest silk thread of memories. And we have to be very careful how we cultivate those pearls and we thread that necklace. Does this meeting by any chance have to do with Vic Van Leer? I grew up in the burbs, freak. I wasn't poor, upper middle class, comfortable. My daddy worked as an accountant for one of the largest insurance firms in the country. Smart with his money. Mom didn't have to work. I went to boarding school. And then my dad died of a heart attack when I was a freshman at MIT. I was a movie geek. Wanted to be a civil engineer, but I made my fortune by becoming a hybrid of both those interests. My dad didn't want me to be an accountant. <laughs> oh, listen to this. My best friend was a guy named Isidore. <laughs> yeah, we called him Izzy. He was one of the smartest human beings I have ever met in my life. I mean, Izzy was taking second-year college calculus courses as a high school sophomore, right? Straight-A student, full ride to MIT. Izzy had the world at his fingertips. But he was always looking for trouble, and trouble found him. He ran with the wrong crowd. And when we got to MIT, he got this great job working for a financial consulting firm in Boston. But every weekend, he would fly to Vegas. You see, Izzy had a system for counting cards in Vegas that had the big casinos on the strip. Oh, stymied! He would come back to MIT with suitcases filled with $200,000 in cold cash. What? Yeah. So your man Izzy was getting hit off like that? Like a fat rat in a cheddar cheese factory, freak. Cheddar cheese. Okay, so what happened to this dude Izzy? Because he's dope. <laughs> no, not dope. Dead. Oh. After he'd been missing for three weeks, the Nevada State Police never found hide nor hair of Isidore. And our friendship took a hit when he asked me to hang out with him in Vegas. And I said I wouldn't do it. Because I knew he was on a dark and twisted path in his life. And yes, yes, he was my dude. But no way was I going to throw my life away trying to show my loyalty to a guy who really and truly didn't understand what loyalty was all about. So this meeting is about Vic. Correctamente. Okay, well, sir, Vic isn't Izzy. And why is that, freak? Well, for one thing, you and your dead friend Izzy didn't grow up poor. Me and Vic grew up in a neighborhood where we had to look over our shoulder every two seconds to make sure nobody was going to walk up on us and rob us. True. Izzy and I did not grow up in the hood. But we, like you, thankfully grew up in a two-parent household. But even that wasn't enough for Izzy. He wasn't satisfied. He was always looking for a five-alarm fire when he already had the warmth and comfort of a loving family. This is not about class warfare, freak. This is about the consequences of making bad choices and risking it all when you feel like you have nothing to lose. Vic is like a brother to me, sir. But you shouldn't be brother Vic's keeper, freak. Would a brother go looking for trouble and put your career and your livelihood at risk by getting into fights at nightclubs and seedy after-hour joints and then scream to the media, oh, it's all good, I'm an F.O.F., friend of freak. It's all misunderstanding. Y'all be haters, don't hate my game.
I don't think a brother would do that to someone they really cared about, but a guy who looked at you like a meal ticket would. No. So you don't understand Vic. Really? I don't understand. No. Look, man, it was a misunderstanding with the guy in the next VIP pool. His honey started flirting with me. Naturally, I started flirting back. Next thing I know, Captain Cornball's off my grill piece of beef, and next thing he know, he got a two-piece and a biscuit on his left eye. Hey, <laughs> nah, nah, I, I don't know who hit him. And he damn sure wasn't me. Hey. <laughs> Captain Cornball's mad because I'm an F-O-F, friend of freak. <laughs> hey, well, check this out, though. He needs to train that hottie before he leave the house, though. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> he's, he's hottie they ain't loyal, man. <laughs> What's there to understand? Are you freaking blind? You know, I just want to know, how much did you pay your lawyers to make all this go away? Almost 100000 Excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. I said I paid almost $100,000. Exactly. And if you keep riding shotgun with Vic, you're going to go broke. Quick, fast, and in a hurry. But Vic is my friend, and I grew up with him. How many times I got to tell you, sir? Freak, this is not a request. I am not asking you to do this. I am telling you to do this. And the first order of business is that Mr. Vic Van Leer is banned from traveling with you on the road. Vic is banned from the locker room. And Vic is banned from this arena. And if I catch this guy, Vic, in or anywhere near the facilities, Mr. Vic Van Leer will be arrested for trespassing. Are you serious, sir? Brother, I'm as serious as cancer. We all know that can be deadly. You know. Me and Vic were kids, playing summer tournaments at the Dome. We always imagined making it to the pros. And after the crowds left, just a streetlight was on the court, like 11.30, 12 midnight, even one in the morning sometimes. <laughs> we used to practice player introductions, running on the court, giving dabs, high-fiving the teammates. Vic, he would act as an announcer. You know, he would introduce me, announce my name on a loudspeaker, and the, the jumbotron would uh, flash my image like a little guy dressed in long shorts and a jersey. And now, fresh off his three-game, 62-point scoring streak, the youngest player to ever do so in NBA history, frequency vibrations! <laughs> So me and Vic would sit in those empty bleachers at the dome and dream like nobody's business. And now, and now I'm living a dream. For real. And in so many ways, Vic was part of that. Please, listen to me. I mean, I know this guy's your dude from way back. No. Me and Vic go way back like the front seats of a 67 Cadillac. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's we go way back. Did you say, did you say front seats? Fr front seats of a 67 Cadillac. We go way back like the front seats of a 67 Cadillac. Well, do you have any crickets? <laughs> I'm gonna be the hit once again at Herbie Allen's Sun Valley Shindig because my fellow billionaires love it when I walk and talk that talk. So that almost sounds... <laughs> no, let me tell you exactly what it sounds like. I respect, admire, and most importantly, love you as a human being and a role model. But I pay you a lot. And I mean I pay you a lot of money to play for my team. And I am in this game to win it. And you can't win it with an albatross around your neck like Vic. So Vic is done. History. And here's some more lingo that I picked up from a former megastar who used to play for me several seasons ago. Thought I would never release him until I did. And now he's the sixth man on a struggling team in Venice. And yeah, I'm talking Venice with the canals and the gondolas and Harry's Bar, not the street ballers next to the fortune tellers on the beach in Cali. 
This guy used to tell me when he thought there was a player destroying our team. Don't be a hero. Cut that zero. And that is what I am telling you about, Vic. Freak. Don't be a hero. Cut that zero. The only thing Vic brings into your life is headache and unwanted and unnecessary negative attention. And it will begin to affect your mindset. And when it affects your mindset, it's gonna affect your play. And when it affects your play, it's gonna affect my team. And when it affects my team, it's gonna affect my money. And if it affects my money, Google Translate will become your new freaking friend. I want a championship ring, freak, and I want you to help me get that ring. And banners, after banners, hanging from the Raptors in this arena. So, freak, hear me clearly and hear me good. V, G, G, Vic, gotta go. Handle your business. And remember, that contract you signed contains a morality clause, a very important clause that revolves around your conduct on and off the court, and how it can negatively impact my team. Now, I don't want you to have to learn Italian or Croatian as a second language. And hey, playing pro ball overseas, there's nothing wrong with that. But the arenas are nothing like this, nor will the money be the same. And on top of all of that, this is the U.S. of A, the greatest freaking country in the world. Ask yourself, <laughs> is Vic worth all that? Think about it. Think long, think wrong. Dang. He, he has a bad rap. It's not, and I understand some of his judgments might shadow his actual character. He's not that at all. Man, Vic, let me tell you something. We actually, like, we have love for each other. We're brothers. Blood couldn't make us any closer at all. I mean, he, he has so much um, loyalty to me and to my family. You can see even Cece, you know, has uh, issues with him, but he's, he still loves her. He still loves her. 